Would you all stand with me this morning and let's sing together, Majesty.
church planter in Utah. My wife Grayson and I have lived here for seven years. Um, she is the principal at a charter school here in town. And uh, a year and a half ago, we welcomed the arrival of our first child, uh, a little boy named Jacob. Uh, our ministry in Utah is unique for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we are multi-site, which means we're one church uh, that happens to meet in two different places. So we have a campus uh, here in Provo where we live, and then another one 35 miles north in Taylorsville, uh, which is a suburb of Salt Lake City. Um, and then two, Utah is, is predominantly Mormon, Latter-day Saint, and so that brings with it some um, unique challenges. Taylorsville is a, a city of about 60,000 people. It's about 60% professed Mormon. Uh, Provo is part of a metropolitan area of a quarter of a million people, and it's 98% uh, professed Mormon. Uh, but what's exciting is for all of the obstacles that brings, there are incredible opportunities here for the gospel. And so we are so thankful for your prayers uh, and you're reaching out to us and thinking of us. Thank you so much. I'm excited about what God is going to continue to do here in Utah as churches like you uh, stand with us. Good morning. Um, for those of you that are first timers, this is our missionaries moment. And um, I'm up here to bring to you the Wolf family today. Um, they have Logan, Grayson, and Jacob. Um, that they have a praise item. They're baptizing a young man named Bryce, which was last weekend. They're um, so excited about his profession of faith. Um, and now I just want to take them to the good Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this family, Lord. I thank you for um, this man's faith and where he stands with you, follow, Father, and following you. Um, God, I pray that you're with his family and with his churches as they continue to grow. And I pray, God, that you're seen in everything that they do. Father, we love you so much and thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Fulton Free Will this morning. Glad you are with us in service today. If you're a first-time guest with us, we welcome you, and we hope that you are made to feel so welcome here with us here at Fulton Free Will. Uh, let me give you a few announcements this morning. One that is not in your bulletin is that on Sunday night, April the 22nd, at 6 o'clock here at the church, uh, we're going to have a group in known as... Uh, that is called the Wil Williamsons. They have been here before. Um, and uh, so we hope that you will make plans to be here for that. Uh, there will be a love offering taken for them that night. Uh, but we hope you'll spread the word, share it. I put it up on Facebook, on our church page, on my, uh, my personal page. Uh, so please uh, share that uh, post on your Facebook because that's one of the best ways we can get the word out is through Facebook. And so I uh, hope you will share that, invite others uh, for Sunday night, April the 22nd here at the church. Uh, also, graduates, if, you, if you're graduating this year, uh, our graduation Sunday is going to be May the 6th. Please let either Belinda or myself know concerning that. Uh, wings, uh, women interested in growing spiritually, your Bible study begins today. Uh, that'll be at 4.30 in the examples classroom uh, our youth ministry, so you can meet there, so please remember that. Also, ladies' paint party, uh, that is this Tuesday, 6 o'clock, in the Family Life Center. Uh, also, in conjunction with that, ladies, if you could bring some finger food, you're going to eat that night, so please bring finger foods for that. Also, ladies' day out, Saturday, April the 28th, from 3 to 5, uh, you'll be headed towards the Tremont First Baptist Church uh, 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 for a special speaker there that evening. So please remember those things if you would. And there's some other announcements you can see that are in your bulletin. And so let's, let's have our ushers come forward and we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings. If you're a first-time guest and you had a card to fill out, you, you can easily just drop that in the offering plate and it will get to where it needs to be. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your blessings to us. Uh, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather together with 
your people, Lord, to lift up your name, to glorify you, to worship you today. And so, Lord, we pray that as we've met, as we've come together today, Lord, that we pray that your Holy Spirit would come and move amongst us, Lord. We pray that he would have free reign in this place and he would touch every heart that's here. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us uh, through your word today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would challenge us through your word today. And Lord, we just pray your blessings on the rest of the service. Uh, bless the offering now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> Again with me this morning to God be the glory. Thank you. 
Bibles, be turning with me to the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 5. We had begun the book of Acts several, uh, well actually in January, and then we took a break uh, leading up to Easter, looking at uh, those last days of Jesus uh, leading up to crucifixion, and then we celebrated Easter last week, and so we're going to dive back into the book of Acts this morning, and so that brings us to chapter 5 of the book of Acts. I want to read you a, um, an account of something that took place just a couple of years ago. Islamic extremists from the Somali rebel Al-Shabaab, I mention that group because you've probably seen them in the news over the last few years, uh, turned the Mandera era of northern Kenya into a cauldron of fear with bomb, gun, and grenade attacks in a campaign to rid the area of Christians. On October the 25th, 2016, Al-Shabaab militants took responsibility for a pre-dawn attack in which the rebels shot 12 non-local Kenyans whom they presumed were Christians. On October the 6th, suspected Al-Shabaab militants targeted Christians in a grenade and gun attack in the early morning and killed six. The attacks were targeted predominantly Christian migrant workers from Kenya's interior. A spokesman for Al-Shabaab, which that just kind of seems kind of weird to me that a terrorist organization has a spokesperson, but anyway, said on, uh, that the attack on October the 6th was designed to drive Christians from the area. At least one of the victims was a reported Muslim. The attack in Mandera, tucked in Kenya's northeast corner of the Somali border, reportedly wounded several others. Among 27 people that were rescued were Christians who arrived at their church traumatized and in shock. One of those people said, quote, The loud grenade woke me up, and I heard one of the attackers saying that the infidels should leave the Muslim area of Mandera, end quote. quote he went on to say, quote, They were loud cries for help as the attackers were shooting from all directions. In another pre-dawn raid on a predominantly Christian area in the coastal Kenya, Al-Shabaab rebels on January the 31st killed at least four Christians, beheading one of them. Persecution. That word can bring different emotions to us as believers. Um, it, can, it can raise questions of why. Why us, why, or, or why not us, why them? Why does the Lord not stop it? Why does he not intervene? All sorts of questions of why can ring into our heads. This morning as we go back to the book of Acts, there is a theme that you cannot not see in the book of Acts. And that is the theme of persecution of believers. 
Now, the book of Acts, if you remember, the book of Acts comes directly after the life of Jesus. It comes after his crucifixion, after his death, after his resurrection, rather, and, and then also after he ascends back to heaven. We see in chapter 2 of Acts that the day of Pentecost takes place, which is the birth of the church. And then as you move through the book of Acts, you see how God is doing some amazing things, and we'll see that just a little bit. But, but throughout, woven in between all of that God was doing, there was something going on called persecution. And so you can't get away from it. And so we're not going to avoid it either because it's in His Word. And so this morning I want to remind us, before we dive into the text of Acts 5, I just want to remind us that Jesus said it would come. Persecution would come. So He said in John 15, He says, If the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you, were on, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they, if you, if they kept my word, they will also keep yours but all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. And then after that, in, in, in John 15, 18 through 21 that I just read, he, he says some other things, and then you get down to chapter 16, and, he, and he, say, he states this in verses 1 through 4. He says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Now think about the apostles and what they went through uh, in particular. Uh, He says, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think that he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. So the background of what we're going to look at this morning is that God is doing some amazing things in the book of Acts. He is doing some amazing things in the early church. When you look at verses 12 uh, through 16, we see that God was was just doing unbelievable things through the apostles. People were being saved. Multitudes were coming to know Christ as Savior. Multitudes, others, were being uh, healed of various things, so much so that when you read those few verses, you see that, that they, they were laying people in the streets on mats and on cots, and, and they were just hoping that as the apostles went by, that their shadow would hopefully just touch those who were sick. That's what God was doing. Unbelievable things. The church was exploding in growth. And then we have the religious leaders as we come to our text that they could not stand the idea of so many people coming to know Christ as Savior. The religious leaders did not like the fact that all these people were coming to Christ and they could not stand the fact that their power over the people were diminishing. In verse 17 of Acts 5 it says, But the high priest rose up... Uh, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. And so this brings us to the first form of persecution that we see in our text today. There will be three forms of persecution that we see, but our focus isn't the form of persecution. What I want us to see is what God is doing in the persecution. The first uh, thing that we see is, is that, that it's going to be, there's an arrest that's about to take place. But I want to throw this question out to us for us to think about. If persecution comes to our nation, if it was to come to our doorsteps, the question would be this. Are we spiritually ready? I didn't ask physically. I said, are we spiritually ready? if it was to come to our door. So three, three things I want us to see this morning concerning God's faithfulness in persecution. The first thing we see is persecuted but not abandoned. We see that in 17 through 26. Notice verse 18 first of all. 
It says they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. The first form of persecution we see here in the text is that they arrested the apostles. Now I want you to focus in on the, the, the two words there at the end of the verse, which is public prison. That's different than what they've had in the past. For example, in Acts 4.3, where Peter and John have been taken by the Sadducees, they were, they were arrested, but they were just held under guard. They had some men that kept them under guard until the next day when they would have to stand before the council and give an account for what they had done. John Gill, in his commentary, Gill, Gill um, if you remember Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon in the mid-1800s, the great preacher of then... Gill preached at Spurgeon's church a hundred years prior to Spurgeon. And so he has a commentary that I like to refer to several much. And, and he says concerning Acts 4.3, he says, It was not in the common public prison as in Acts 5.18 that we just read, uh, but they put them in the hands and under the care and custody of a set of men to keep and to guard them that they might not go away until they had opportunity of bringing them before the Sanhedrin to be examined and punished by them, end quote. So this time in Acts 5.18, it's different. They did not just contain them until the next day. They actually put them in prison. They were in jail. And Gill goes on to state that they would have done this for basically two reasons. One was greater security. And number two is greater disgrace. And we'll see why that is here in just a little bit. But what I want you to know is neither one succeeds. The security did not help, and they were not disgraced in the, in the sense of that they walked away from Christ or they walked away from preaching the gospel. They failed. So they are persecuted, but as we also see, they were persecuted but not abandoned. Look at verses 19 through the first part of 21. He says, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they had heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. So they were released from prison, miraculously by God, through an angel. And they're told, go preach. Don't, not, not go back to your house and hide out there. Not that you need to leave the city. Now there's times when you look at Paul's ministry, the Apostle Paul, there were times in Paul's ministry when, when uh, uh, the Lord directed him, I need you to leave the city. And then there's other times that he was to stay in the city. So it's all about what the Lord was doing and what the Lord was directing his people to do. At this point it was saying, stay here. Go back to the temple in Jerusalem and just start doing what you were doing before. Just go preach. Now here's what I want to think. The angel of the Lord that appeared or an angel of God that appeared that night, we're not given the details about what that looked like. But as you read other accounts in Scripture of when an angel appeared, I, I, I wrote down a term that some of us will be familiar with, uh, especially if you watch the first... Uh, Persian Gulf War. I have a feeling those guards experienced something called shock and awe. Remember that? Remember that term back in the day? I have a feeling that's what those guards experienced when that angel of God appeared, and I believe they probably fell as dead men because the angel showed up and he released them. And then we have the angel's message, of course, which was to go back to the temple and begin to preach. Then we see in verses 21 through 26 that the, the apostles, go, they do what they're told. Uh, the Lord said, go back and preach, so that's what they do. And then what we see again is that they're taken again. They're recaptured. Look at verse 21. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council all the sin of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We have found, or we found the prison securely locked, and the guards standing at the doors. 
But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what would uh, what this would come or wondering what this would come to and someone came and told them look the men who you put whom you put to, in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people then the captain with the officers went and brought them not by force for they were afraid of being stoned by the people the sadducees guards came and this time the perhaps uh, they, they probably tried to explain to the apostles, listen, we just need you to come back with us. There's nothing going to happen to you. It's all going to be okay. They just need to talk to you. They want to meet with you. And so they came. There have been times throughout history when God's people has been asked and sometimes even promised that if they would just simply come quietly, that nothing bad would happen. And sadly, many times believers either went to prison when they showed up or they were martyred when they showed up. And the people just simply did not keep their word. The second thing I want us to see this morning is that uh, as we think about now, so the, the apostles are now coming back before the council, the, the, the Sadducees. And we, we come to the second form of persecution that takes place in verses 27 and 28, and that is intimidation. And what we're going to see is that they were persecuted, yet they were still bold for the faith. Notice 27 and 28 says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. The Sadducees now wanted to intimidate the apostles. So they bring them, one, they bring them before the whole council. And then secondly, they begin to question. Now if you notice verse 28, there was no question there. There was no question. It was him making a statement. And he says, what? He says he, basically he's reminding them, don't you remember we told you don't Preach Jesus' name. Don't mention His name. Because there's power in that name, isn't it? Jesus' name can absolutely change everything. And they did not like the fact that Jesus' death was being laid at their feet. That's why he says, and, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You know what they had? It's called a guilty conscience. Because Jesus' death, rightly so, was laid at their feet. Can I remind us that we are now living in a day in our own nation of a time of intimidation. We're living in a time when, it's, when if you don't go along with the minority on whatever that issue is, then you face intimidation. They will pick at your house, they will pick at your business, they will pick at your place of worship, and they do it, and they do it in the name of tolerance, but they do it with intimidation. And I'm going to tell us now that there will come a time that if things don't change, if we don't change the direct directory, the trajectory rather of where we're headed as a nation, that there will come a time that when we teach God's word, they will come for us. The apostles, what we see is though they were persecuted with intimidation, though they were persecuted with arrest. They were still bold in the faith. Notice verses 29 through 33. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand and, and leader and sa as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. 
And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. When they heard these things, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. I hope you caught it because Peter made the most profound statement. A mentality that we all as believers need to have. And that is that we must obey God rather than men. We have to decide that living for the Lord is the most important thing in our life. It is greater than a relationship. It is greater than a job. It is greater than a job promotion. It is greater than any money in the world. It is greater than any pleasure you can find in in this life. Living for Him is the greatest thing you can have in this life. And we have to decide that we are going to be obedient to Him no matter the cost. It is why Jesus said, If anyone comes after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? We will all have moments. All of us are going to have moments where we have to make a decision. We will all have moments when we will have to show the world where our allegiance lies. We will all have those moments where the line is drawn in the sand. And we will choose what side we stand on. Now in verses 34 through 39 we see that they are persecuted and yet they are protected. He says, But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, Take care... Uh, Excuse me, yeah. Men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas Theudas, uh, rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas, the uh, Galilean, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. Now let me say up front that I do not mean when I said persecuted yet protected, I am not saying that the Lord will always keep us from death if we are persecuted or if a person is persecuted. That's just not the case. There have been millions of people who have died for the faith, who was given the option, reject Christ or die, and they chose death. But remember, they were facing death here. Remember remember verse 33. They were enraged and they wanted to kill them. I believe that the Lord used this man, Gamaliel, to save the apostles that day. There's a reason. God was not finished with the apostles. There were churches that were still to be established. There were scriptures that still needed to be written, that would be written. And so God used this man, Gamaliel, so that the apostles would be saved. Let me also just say this, that either way, the Lord will be glorified. Whether he saves someone in that moment or he allows that person to come home to be with him, through both, the Lord will be glorified. So what we've seen so far is that they have been persecuted but not abandoned. They have been persecuted, yet they are bold. And finally, they are persecuted Yet, they rejoiced. 
verses 40 and 42, through 42. Let's start with verse 40. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So we had arrest, we had intimidation, and now we have physical abuse and basically more intimidation in verse 40. Now the term beat them, what did, what did it mean that they beat them that day? Well, this would be the beating where they would have received 39 lashes each. It would be done by the Jews for minor offenses. So basically the idea is simply this. They received 39 lashes because they spoke the name Jesus. They received 39 lashes because they simply told people that Jesus is Messiah and that if you want salvation, you need this Jesus. They received 39 lashes because, because the, the, they went out and they said, listen, there is eternal life, but it's found in Jesus. This was the first whipping of Christians, but it would not be the last. But yet what we see in verse 41 is that even though they were persecuted and they were beaten, they rejoiced. Verse 41 says, Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. It's an amazing verse, isn't it? Barnes notes concerning the verse says, quote, Nothing to most people would seem more disgraceful than a public whipping. It is a punishment inflicted usually not so much because it gives pain as because it is esteemed to be attended with disgrace. The Jewish rulers doubtless desired that the apostles might be so affected with the sense of this disgrace as to be unwilling to appear again in public or to preach the gospel anymore. End quote. It was, it was their attempt to, to so degrade them that they, that they would just kind of, well, they would just tuck their head between their, their, head, their, their legs and just go off and never do anything else, right? That's the idea. But they didn't do that, did they? They rejoiced. Why did they rejoice? You've just been humiliated. You've just been thrown in jail. You've just been intimidated, and yet they rejoice. Well, very simply, they rejoiced because it identified them with Jesus. That's why they rejoiced. Their Lord had been beaten and He had suffered and now they got to be beaten and suffer as their Lord. Because they know that they're not greater than their Master. So what did they do? Well, we, they left rejoicing. Well, verse 42 tells us what they did. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. They not only rejoiced, but they kept right on teaching and preaching Christ. They went, from, they, they, listen, they went back to the temple they went back to the very place where it all took place, where it all went down. They went to the temple. They went from house to house. They went to absolutely wherever they were, wherever they found themselves, they shared Christ. They shared Jesus. So my question for us today is simply this. What do we do with this? What are we supposed to do with this? I found an article as I was preparing this. I, was, I came across an article from Billy Graham. And it is entitled, Prepare for Persecution, a message from Billy Graham. Now, and he asked two questions. What would you do if persecution came to America, and how can we prepare now? Now, here's what's interesting about the article. It was not written in 2012. It was not written in 2010. It was written in 1957. And the article is as relevant today if not more so than it was in 1957. So let me share with you the things that Graham shared, and I'm going to do this quickly. 
Let me share with you the five things he says we have to do. Because my original question up front was, will we be spiritually prepared for if persecution comes? Now, when I say persecution comes, I don't necessarily mean what happens in Kenya. Could. I'm not saying it's going to. But listen, there are restrictions just north of our border that if some of those laws that passed in Canada pass here will cause us great problems as believers. Great problems. So let me just, so here's what Graham laid out. He says, number one, you need to make sure. What does he mean? He says, make sure of your relationship to God. Make sure you know Jesus. First and foremost. Secondly, walk with God. We need to walk with Him every day. It is not something we pick up on Sunday morning. It's not something we take off Sunday night. It's not something we do when we first just walk in the church building. It is walking with God every day. Abraham walked with God and he was called the friend of God. Moses walked with God and when the hour of judgment fell, it was Moses who was the one that led his people out of Egyptian bondage. David walked with God as a shepherd boy and when the time of crisis came, David was prepared to meet it. Daniel and his friends walked with God in Babylon. And when trouble came, God was with them and he rescued them. So my encouragement to us would be walk with God now. Walk with him daily. Thirdly, Graham says assimilate scripture. He says, we, he says quote, we, need, we should fortify ourselves with the word of God. Begin reading, studying, and memorizing Scripture as never before. Ephesians 6.14 says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Truth is the Word of God. It's the Bible. End quote. And I remind us of this truth. That if we have the Scriptures on the inside of us, no one can take that away. Fourthly, Graham says, pray always. He says, fortify yourself with prayer. The Bible referring to the, quote, the evil day says, quote, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 18. If we are to stand uncompromisingly for Christ, when a national crisis comes, we must rediscover, and this was written in 1957, we must rediscover the power of prayer. And lastly, he says, meditate on Christ. He says, we must fortify ourselves by meditating upon the person of Christ. Charles Spurgeon said this, quote, there have never been 15 minutes in my life when I did not sense the presence of Christ. End quote. Now that statement really hit me hard. And I had to ask myself, can, can I say that? About me, personally? But there's never been 15 minutes, there's never been 15 minutes when I did not feel the presence of Christ. Graham goes on to say, we must learn again to practice the presence of God. Christ must be vitally real to us if we are to prove loyal to Him in the hours of crisis. So very simply it's this. Are you ready? Are you ready? That Lord forbid if, 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 if laws are passed and, and or not even if, listen, we're living in a day right now that it, it doesn't matter about the law anymore. If, if a group decides they don't like you because of something you stay, say, if you stand for a truth that you know is true and they don't like it, 
They're coming. And many times the law is not, even though it's against the law, the law is not on our side. They side with the others. Because we're just living in a day when down is up and up is down. And so the question is, are we spiritually ready? And only you can answer that for yourself. And only I can answer that for myself. Let me get you to stand for just a second. We're not going to do any music this morning. We're going to pray here in just a second. We're going to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world. But I want us to pray for us. I want us to pray for us that that we would be spiritually ready. That we are walking with God daily. That we're in His Word daily. That we are praying daily. That we're submitting ourselves to the Spirit who lives in us as Christians daily. So I I just encourage you to allow the Spirit to work in your life. Just let Him work and move and let Him point out things if He needs to point things out. If He, if he, if he points to something in your life and He's like, yeah, you, need to, you need to repent of this and you need to turn this over to me. And you need to, maybe He says you need to read your Bible more. Maybe He says you need to pray more. Maybe He says whatever He says, my encouragement to you is, as we get ready to pray is just submit to that. Just, just humble yourself and submit to it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us today. Lord, we thank you so much for Christ. We thank you for salvation. We thank you, Lord, that you desire to walk with us every single day of our lives. Lord, forgive us when we are spiritually lazy. Forgive us for not thinking of your word more. uh, uh, May we not not exalting it like we need to. That we're not upholding it like we should. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for pretending that this is just some ordinary book. Lord, forgive us that forgive us for when we don't place that word in the in the right place. Lord, I pray that you would watch over your children today, those who are in harm's way. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ all over this world who are in harm's way, Lord, who will meet today or tonight and And as they meet, they have to do it in secret. That it's the underground church. Or maybe it's those who, Lord, who meet in a public place, but yet they're still, they're, they're, they're in harm's way. We pray for those who persecute today, Lord. That they would see the grace that you have for them. Lord, I pray that they would see the truth of the gospel. I pray, Lord, that they would see their need for Jesus. Lord, I pray as we live our lives this week that you would strengthen us to live it for you. Lord, forgive us for putting ourselves upon the throne. 
and not giving you your, your rightful place. So Lord, I pray this week that we would be witnesses for you. Be glorified in our lives, Lord, we pray. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, we'll have service again this evening at 6 o'clock. Uh, please feel free to come back and be with us. Love for you to do that. You are dismissed. <laughs>